I'm Fred Luda, pastor from Louisiana and former Southern Baptist Convention president. I'm here to nominate Ed Litton. On June 15, 2021, messengers to the Southern Baptist Convention elected Harry Edward Litton Jr., senior pastor of Redemption Church in Saraland, Alabama, as the president of the nation's largest Protestant denomination. When he was our pastor's conference president, he led us with an altar call for broken pastors. Ed knows that God calls the broken because he has walked a hard journey. Litton narrowly defeated his ultra-conservative opponent, Mike Stone, in a runoff election by a few hundred votes. Litton and his wife, Kathy and Ed, is the pastor of the Redemption Church in Saraland, Alabama. Welcome, President Litton. Ed Litton ran on a platform of unity and considered himself to have a mandate from the Feminist Church II movement to investigate sexual abuse in cooperating churches and implement a plan to address it. Friends, we need a uniter, and Ed is uniquely qualified to do that. In the face of some very difficult but necessary conversations in our SBC family about abuse, Ed Litton brings a compassionate and shepherding heart. Little did these messengers know, the man they voted for was about to be caught up in a massive scandal of epic proportions. I think the, the greatest need is humility, uh, to humble ourselves, to listen, and to, to ask God for grace to hear what people are actually saying, and to seek to find agreement. Um, and, and the agreement ultimately, even if we disagree, we come back to the foundation, foundational principle of Scripture that we are to love each other, um, and even if we don't see eye to eye. Shortly after the election, Reformation Charlotte revealed that Ed Litton had preached a sermon from Romans 1 using language that was very similar to the language that his predecessor, J.D. Greer of Summit Church in Raleigh, North Carolina, had preached a year earlier. And the only way this is going to be in balance is through the grace of God, through the cross of Jesus Christ. But the first commandment in that second part, that horizontal part, is honor your father and your mother. You see... This is the seedbed of rebellion. In the Bible, sexual sin is whispered compared to the shout God makes about greed and judgmentalism. The language used was a quotation from Jen Wilkin who said that, quote, we should whisper about what the Bible whispers about and shout about what the Bible shouts about. Both Greer and Lytton then added that, quote, the Bible whispers about homosexuality while it shouts about other sins. And, and there is a story up at ReformationCharlotte.org. Uh, they cover a lot of uh, religious-themed news. Uh, this is the headline, Like J.D. Greer, the new Southern Baptist Convention president, says the Bible whispers about homosexuality. W what, are what are they talking about here, Dr. Jeffers? If this report is true, it is tremendously troubling. The article goes on to say that these two men talk about that homosexuality is not as serious of a sin as other sins in the Bible. Look, first of all, the comment is wrong. Uh, when you go to Romans 1, when Paul writes about the topic of homosexuality, he doesn't use his whisper voice. He says, in fact, it is unlike any sin in, in the universe because it is not only the cause of God's judgment, it is also the result of God's judgment. Paul said, when people reject God, the truth about God, he gives them over to homosexuality, to what the Bible calls degrading passions, 
unnatural act. So it is different. Of course, any sin, Todd, can be forgiven by Jesus Christ, but we cannot, absolutely cannot uh, diminish the seriousness of that sin. But Todd, I'd also say if these comments from Ed Litton and J.D. Greer are true, they are very unloving comments as well. The most loving thing you can do with anybody is to tell them the truth. And I have many teenagers, young adults in my church, J.D. does in his, Ed does in his, whether they know it or not, who are struggling with this issue of sexuality and gender confusion. And when a man of God stands up and stutters and waffles and wavers on this, he is giving indirect permission for people to enter a lifestyle that is degrading and destructive. That is an unloving thing to do. This is a time anybody who's a minister of the gospel, but especially somebody who is a leader of the largest Protestant denomination in the world, needs to speak with absolute clarity on this issue. That's an amazing statement. That's like saying that God whispers about incest or God whispers about bestiality. I mean, uh, yes, it's true that there are not a huge number of texts dealing with homosexual practice, uh, but it's sort of like saying, you know, I, I, in all the churches I've ever been to throughout my life, I've never heard an evangelical pastor give a sermon about why you shouldn't have sex with your mother or your sister. But I've never deduced from that that God whispers. <laughs> I've always instead concluded that not that incest is not really a big issue or it's an agree to disagree issue, but rather I've concluded it's such an irreducible minimum of human sexual ethics that to, to talk about it at all, even, mm -hmm. is to some extent already a defeat for the church mm -hmm. because it should be absolutely a non-negotiable given by the church that this is a boundary that we could never cross. Soon after, it became clear that Lytton didn't just steal that line, he plagiarized the entire sermon. We'll give you a warning here that this might be the toughest week that we will have in the book of Romans. Romans 1, the end of it is tied in difficulty only with Romans 5, Romans 9, and Romans 11. This may be one of the toughest passages we face in the book of Romans. This is the steep climb I talked about. So in fact, let's just sort of loosen things up right now. Everybody turn right now to your neighbor, look them in the eyes. If you know them, if you know them, put your hand on their shoulder and say, this is gonna be a really tough week for you, okay? And tell them, say, I'm praying for you to have the faith and humility to receive this word. I want you to turn to your neighbor right now. And I, I want you to say, I know this sermon's gonna be really tough for you, but I'm here praying that you will listen and obey whatever God says. Go ahead, do that right now. But y'all, we believe that God's word is good, do we not? You see, we believe that God's word is good. In some of my travels overseas, I'll, I'll go into these temples that are erected to a foreign God. I remember being in one of them um, a, a while ago over in uh, somewhere um, uh, in Asia. And Paul David Tripp is a favorite pastor of mine to read. He's a pastor in Philadelphia. Uh, he was on a mission trip to Nepal and he went, he was taken by a missionary into a temple. And there was, uh, I go in this temple, it's this gigantic, I mean, beautiful temple. And right in the middle of it is a, about a 25 foot statue of a, a goddess who has multiple breasts and, and multiple arms. And, you and he said, and I, I will not go into details, but he does explain it, uh, that there was an idol in the center of this temple. He said it was one of the most grotesque things he's ever seen. Watch these worshipers come in and they would prostrate themselves before this statue. And many of them were very emotional. Many had traveled a lot of miles to get uh, to this. Um, very poor, some of them, and taking the little money they had and pouring it out and offering before this statue of this God. And but what really turned his stomach wasn't the shape of the idol. It was how people were bowing down to it, kissing it, putting money on it. He met a family that had walked for four months to get to this idol. Later, finding myself just going back over that incident in my mind and, and feeling sorry for the people there and thanking God kind of in my heart that I wasn't, I wasn't like them. But and he walked out of that temple saying, thank God I'm not like them. Then in the middle of that thought, it just occurred to me. I had a whole list of things in my heart that have taken God's place just like that statue had. And when the spirit of God said, Paul, you are exactly like them. I compared it to if the earth were to say to the sun, I am sick and tired of you being in the middle of the solar system. If the earth were to ask the sun in our solar system, I'm sick and tired of floating out here in nothingness, surrounding you constantly. I wanna be the center of this solar system. The sun might just say to the earth, all right, have it your way. 
The earth is 30,000 times smaller than the sun and would not have the ability to keep all the planets in orbit. And so the solar system would begin to unravel simply because the sun gave to the earth what it asked for. Folks, our entire solar system would fall apart. Why? Because the earth doesn't have the power of light and it doesn't have the power of gravitational force to hold this solar system in existence. Oh, sexual disorder, that was the first thing, verses 26 and 27. Now we've got economic disorder. There there's economic disorder. Look at verse 29. Social disorder. He says there's social disorder. Social disorder. Just think Facebook. Uh, and that's just on Facebook. Look, uh, then you got spiritual disorder. There's spiritual disorder. They are, you could think of that as family disorder. You got, and there's family disorder. They disobey their parents. You see, there are three ways I see us really going wrong with this in the church at large. Three. I'm going to tell you three ways I think we've gone wrong. Number one. And one, we believe that God doesn't really care about this. First one is that we don't think God cares about this issue. We make the gospel message is not let the gay become straight. The gospel message is let the dead become alive. And the gospel message is not let the gay get straight. The gospel message is let the dead come to life. Which leads me to the second way that I see us going wrong here. Number two, we think it's the worst sin. Here's the second thing I think we do we go wrong and that is thinking homosexuality is the worst of all sins. Jen Wilkin, who's one of our favorite Bible teachers here and who's actually leading our women's conference. She said, she said, we ought to whisper about what the Bible whispers about. And we ought to shout about what it shouts about. And the Bible appears more to whisper when it comes to sexual sin compared to its shouts about materialism and religious pride. In the Bible, sexual sin is whispered compared to the shout God makes about greed and judgmentalism. Throughout Jesus's ministry in his life, we see him demonstrating great, just incredible sympathy for those caught in sexual sin and great animosity toward the religiously proud. Jesus forgave prostitutes, but he was harsh with religious materialists. In fact, Jesus one time, not one time ever said that it was difficult for the same sex attracted to go to heaven. He did say it was easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle I have a needle than it was for a religiously proud or materialistically successful person to enter into the kingdom of God. Matter of fact, he said it will be easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for one of these. Only when we grasp, only when we grasp this truth will we become ministers of the gospel. When we understand like Paul did that we are the worst sinner that we know. Only then when you, only when you understand that will you understand that if Jesus came to die for you, that there's nobody he didn't die for. We can't grasp this gospel till we confess with Paul these words. In 1 Timothy 1.15, he says, this is a trustworthy saying, deserving full acceptance, that Christ has come into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. Here's the third way that we go wrong. Number three, assuming it's hard for LGBTQ people to get to heaven. Thirdly, we go wrong thinking LGBT people can't go to heaven. Homosexuality does not send you to hell. You know how I know that? Because heterosexuality does not send you to heaven. Homosexuality does not send people to hell. How do I know that? Because heterosexuality doesn't send people to heaven. Rosaria Butterfield, whose story I've shared with you before here, she was a practicing lesbian, very outspoken professor of literature and women's studies at Syracuse University. She was a practicing lesbian in a committed lesbian relationship a culture warrior on the far left. She said it was Romans one that brought her to faith in Christ. And then she said, and I quote, homosexuality is not the core of our rebellion against God. A desire to be God is. A desire to be the one who gets to declare good and evil, to play judge rather than be judged. A desire to use God's creation for our own gratification. This prompted both Greer and Lytton to release a statement contending that Lytton had been given permission to use points and illustrations from that sermon, but Lytton acknowledged he should have given credit to Greer. It wasn't long before a social media campaign was ignited to uncover not just one sermon, but multiple sermons had been plagiarized, and at least one dating as far back as 2015.
sound of rustling pages. I just had to give that up. But I do love to see the warm glow of, uh, of, 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 of Scripture on people's faces when I preach. So turn it on. Open your Bibles, if you would. Uh, turn them on. Warm them up. I see the... I love the rustle of uh, the sound of the pages of Scripture. I also now have to enjoy the warm glow of your iPad, your iPhone, your whatever your device is. Open up to Acts chapter 4. Well, one of the biggest objections that people have to Christianity, or at least one that I have heard over the years as I've talked with people, is the idea that Christianity is too narrow. Um, the idea that there is only one way to God um, just sounds like it's, um, it's arrogant for us to say that or it's unfair. You know, the, the idea is, is, is like you got somebody who, you know, has never heard about Jesus. And when they die, God shows up at their deathbed and says, aha, you didn't receive Jesus. And they're like, Jesus who? And he says, well, it's too late now. And he casts their souls into hell. And as they go tumbling into hell, screaming, wait, wait, you know, he mumbles in Latin like tough cookies. First, you'll hear people say it's too narrow. You cannot say there's only one way to heaven. And, and they, they always paint a picture, it seems, of they, I mean, the people I've talked to, will often paint a picture. Well, okay, this is cruel God, guy on his deathbed. Hey, I'm going to throw you into hell. He goes, wait, 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 as he's falling. I, I didn't hear, I didn't know there was another way. And, you, and in Latin, he says, tough cookies. Boom. A video mashup has come to light of several sermons showing plagiarism of illustrations and stories lifted from Greer being presented in the first person by Lytton. Or in the church I grew up in, I was taught that real Christians would never go dancing because dancing always leads to fornication. Of all the sins that were looked down on in my youth group, dancing was considered the worst. My, my youth pastor told me the reason we shouldn't make out with girls is that it might tempt us to go dancing later. He just should never do that. But I remember a time in Redemption Church when it was First Baptist North Mobile, we had a youth pastor that had a strong, passionate issue about dancing. And it was controversial and people would argue and people, and they had special dances, non-dances set up for proms and things like that. Get a homeschool mama and a public school mama together and ask them what is the best educational approach for your child. And then just get some popcorn and sit back and prepare for a UFC bout. Uh, how about homeschool versus public school? Get two moms that are on the opposite ends of this spectrum and get ready for a UFC rumble. I'm just telling you. Wine is a mocker and strong drink is raging and whoever is deceived by it is not wise. Wine is a mocker, strong drink is a brawler, and whoever is led astray by it is not wise. Technically, we are free in Christ to drink alcohol. Technically, you may be free to drink. We know that one in seven people who drink alcohol become an alcoholic, develop a problem with it. One in seven people will develop a problem with alcohol. So why would I, why would I, I have a drink in my house that would ruin the life of one out of every seven people who touches it? And, and so even if, if, even if you don't develop that problem with alcohol, what if one of your children would? What if a friend would? Driver's Ed, I was thinking about this the other day because my daughters are about this age where they're getting into this. And Driver's Ed, I had, I don't, I think they still do it, but the car that I took Driver's Ed in had the guy sitting next to me had this big old brake. That's all he had. Do y'all have this? The big old brake coming out, and it meant that he could stop that car anytime he wanted. And in fact, he did it like after we'd been out about five minutes just to show me that he had it. So I wanted to turn, and he just like slammed that brake and like, you know, slam in there. And what he was showing me was, you think you're in control of this car, and I'm letting you drive, but I can stop this car anytime I want to. I took driver's ed in high school. That was a trip. I'll never forget the guy who was teaching me. I noticed he had a strange thing over, just underneath the, the glove box, there was this brake. And, and when I first pulled out of the parking lot, he stomped on it to show me who really boss was. And, 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 and I'll never forget that. When you come to Christ, he doesn't come, you basically turn over the brake. And you're like, because I would describe probably some of our spiritual lives that way. Is it Jesus is speaking to you? 
And you're like, yeah, yeah, let's do that. Let's go over here. That sounds awesome. Oh, I'll do that. But every once in a while, you're like, nope. And you push that brake in, and the car comes to a halt because you've never actually surrendered it to him. You've kept that brake right in place. To be surrendered to Jesus means to take the brake away. Many of us see our relationship to Christ that way. And I'm not talking about you're the student driver. You're the guy with the brake. And to come to Christ and to surrender to him means that you give him the steering wheel. You need to uninstall that brake, dude. You need to stop slamming on it every time God starts moving in your life. But ultimately, he had the veto power. He had not surrendered the car to me. Until you surrender your brake to the Holy Spirit of God. Friend, you're vetoing God. Who do you think you are? Caligula was unfit to keep a pet, let alone run an empire. He wasn't worthy of having a pet, much less being an emperor. He has his mom and brother killed. He killed his mother and brother. To... He openly committed incest. He openly lived in an incestuous relations. He frequently would cross-dress and go out in public. He was a cross-dresser. He installed his favorite horse, Incititus, as a senator. He, he, made, he, he literally made his horse a Roman senator. I mean, how do you even vote when you're a horse in the Senate? All in favor, say aye. All opposed, wait for it. Can you imagine that? A horse, every time the Senate gathered, a horse would walk in, it was the emperor's horse. When they voted, he would say, nay, 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 nay. What we, I, I showed you the video of Ed Litton plagiarizing the <clears throat> Greer's yeah. message or illustration of driver's ed. What, what were your thoughts when you saw that? Well, the f first thing, of course, it's it's obvious plagiarism. It is possible, it is conceivably possible that Ed Litton and J.D. Greer had the exact same driver's ed teacher. That's conceivably possible. It is conceivably possible that that same teacher gave the same illustration to every class that he, that he had. That is possible. It's also possible that, um, it's, it's conceivably possible that Ed Litton remembers being in driver's ed and he heard J.D. Greer's illustration and then thought, but then he went on to tell that exact illustration of that teacher doing the same thing. It would be one thing if he had simply taken the illustration of a foot pedal on the, on the passenger side of a driver's ed car and, and likened just, just borrowed the illustration and then kind of generalized. Sometimes it's possible for us to do that in a sermon where we hear a good illustration of happened in somebody else's life, but then we don't tell it as if it happened in our own life. Instead, we tell it as, as a good illustration of a point. That's something, you know, if I'm, if I'm taking an illustration from the life of David Livingston, for instance, I don't talk about going to the mission field in Africa <laughs> and meeting <laughs> never before reached tribes, but instead I would talk about somebody who went to the mission field in Africa. All of these videos prove beyond any reasonable doubt that Ed Litton has not only been plagiarizing J.D. Greer for years, but has presented these sermons to his congregation as his own work, thus deceiving and lying to them repeatedly. An official podcast from the Southern Baptist Executive Committee hosted Ed Litton, but failed to address the plagiarism scandal with any sincerity. Instead, they simply ran cover for Litton and allowed him to dismiss the accusations as irrelevant. Uh, today it's you and me, and uh, you know a lot of things going on in the SBC. One of the big ones revolves around a statement that you made last week after a video popped up showing some uh, similarities of a sermon that you'd preached uh, with that of J.D. Greer, and uh, and you released a statement last weekend, and and I'm going to read a part of the statement, and we'll jump into the interview right out of that. But uh, like thousands of other Southern Baptist pastors, I labor every week preparing to stand in front of the congregation God has called me to serve in preparation for our series on Romans. I use several resources to help me think through how to structure the series and how best to communicate the profound truths we encounter in these passages. Now, one of those resources you used, obviously, was a sermon series from 2019 by J.D. Greer. So I know a lot of people have read your statement and still a lot of questions out there. So sure. why don't we just start this, get, let you address that right out the gate. Yeah, no, I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, I stand by the statement. Um, it was a part of our study, and it wasn't just one sermon. I mean, you can hear illustrations and different statements throughout uh, several of those sermons and um, had J.D.'s permission, but encouragement. The scandal eventually made national news, including Newsweek, The Washington Post, 
The Washington Times, and The New York Times. On July 6th, Litton was interviewed at a local CBS affiliate where he doubled down, going on to insist that those people who were making accusations of plagiarism against him were anonymous, referring to them as unnamed sources. Lytton is also seeing how brutal things can be as the leader of the largest Protestant group less than two weeks after becoming president. You've been charged with plagiarism. Allegations Lytton lifted passages in sermons from his predecessor at the convention, J.D. Greer. In a statement, Lytton said he had permission from Greer to use those passages, and Greer agreed. And where did the where did those charges come from? Do you know? I mean, no, they're unnamed. That's part oh, really? of the problem. Okay. Right. So unnamed sources have have uh, are presenting these things, right. which should make everybody take a pause. A number of evangelical leaders have addressed the issue of pulpit plagiarism in the past, treating it with proper disdain and condemnation. In 2006, Al Mohler joined Southern Seminary's Dean of the School of Theology, Herschel, New York, to discuss what was a seemingly novel but growing epidemic in churches around the nation, pulpit plagiarism. In that episode of his podcast, Mohler lambasted as despicable the practice of using another preacher's materials in your sermons and presenting them as your own. We're going to be talking about this particular controversy on today's edition of the Albert Miller Program, and we're going to be doing it because I would, uh, I would venture to say there is hardly a major community in America that has not had a public scandal associated with this, uh, perhaps even in recent years. When it starts making the front pages of the nation's newspapers, we're talking about preaching here. Something is going on that demands Christian attention. We understand adultery and divorce. We understand issues that have moral consequence, but a lot of people simply do not have the vocabulary word plagiarism quite directly at hand. Let me tell you what it is. It is intellectual theft. It's the theft of someone else's ideas presented as your own, or someone else's words, or someone else's material. Caligula was unfit to keep a pet, let alone run an empire. He wasn't worthy of having a pet, much less being an emperor. He has his mom and brother killed. He killed his mother and brother. To... He openly committed incest. He openly lived in an incestuous relationship. He frequently would cross-dress and go out in public. He was a cross-dresser. He installed his favorite horse, Incititus, as a senator. He, he, made, he, he literally made his horse a Roman senator. I mean, how do you even vote when you're a horse in the Senate? All in favor say aye. All opposed? Wait for it. Can you imagine that? A horse, every time the Senate gathered, a horse would walk in, it was the emperor's horse. When they voted, he would say, Nay, or nay, nay, or nay, nay, or nay. In the day when so many sermons are available in printed and in audio form in various ways, it turns out that there are a good number of preachers who simply aren't going into the study and spending hours and hours each week preparing sermons. Instead, they're preaching someone else's material. Preacher in Cincinnati, confronted by this uh, ministry basically over the business. Preacher in Salt Lake City, preacher in Oklahoma City, preacher in, in various towns, you can just name them all, all across the country, uh, who have been embarrassed and, uh, and exposed to preaching other person's material. I read one pastor's defense of it. He called it mentoring rather than plagiarism. And so that, that is a shift. Before, if someone was caught doing it and exposed, they felt the need to apologize. Now, there are many that don't. You know, I, I just find that absolutely shocking. I can't imagine doing that. I can't imagine, you know, words are our business. And I can't imagine preaching someone else's words or, or copying someone else's words and claiming those my own. I want to know if I plagiarized crap in my underground uh, undergrad work, would you take my diploma agree? Because if not, if you wouldn't take this diploma away 
for plagiarism and making stuff up, the diploma is not worth anything. It's not, I mean, and by the way, Ryan Putman won't get me back. He won't call me back. He won't tweet me back. This is a Southern Baptist institution of higher education. And they can't say that they'd pull a degree for plagiarism because they're too busy worried about denominational politics. I paid $60,000 for this degree because I thought it had something to do with integrity. Here is what I think about my college degree from WBC. Because I can't even get the administration to admit that plagiarism is a sin. The problem is not that Al Mohler or Ryan Putman or whoever else won't call Ed Litton to resign. The problem is they won't even call him to repent because they're gutless cowards. That therefore there in verse one, that therefore that starts that chapter is the hinge of the entire book of Romans. You see Romans, if you're doing it in the simplest way to think about it, Romans is divided into two major sections. Chapters one through 11, Paul is telling you all about what the gospel is, 11 chapters worth. In the last five chapters, he's gonna start to unpack what you should be because of the gospel. But the second word, is therefore, it says, I appeal to you therefore, but what is that therefore, therefore? So when you take a 30,000 foot view of the book of Romans and pretty much any of Paul's letters, we see that there are two massive sections of the letter. The first 11 chapters, Paul is telling you about the gospel and what it is. In the last five chapters, he begins to unpack what you should do because of it. And those two sections, what the gospel is and what you should be, are joined together by a single word. One word that's the hinge of the whole book, and that word is therefore. And in these, these two massive sections, they're joined together by one word, therefore. In Romans 12, 1, this is the hinge of those two sections. This is the hinge of the book of Romans. All right, so here we go. Number one, here's the Christian life, Paul says, as living sacrifice. Paul obviously is drawing on Jewish imagery here. Jews, of course, grew up offering sacrifices to God, but even Gentiles in those days would have been familiar with this concept. Obviously, Paul is drawing some, he's drawing on some Jewish imagery here because the Jews, they grew up giving and making sacrifices and the Gentiles, they would have been very much familiar with this concept. The first he says is that the Christian sacrifice of their body is living. Sacrifices in the Old Testament were always dead. Our sacrifice is living. Old Testament sacrifices were always dead. The problem with the living sacrifice is that it wants to keep getting up and crawling down off the altar. And now the problem with the living sacrifice is that it keeps wanting to get off the altar. Right, you should do it in response to the gospel. That's the second way. Is that it's not done to obtain salvation, but in response to it. You see, religious sacrifices in those days, particularly pagan ones, were done to gain something from God, forgiveness or blessing or whatever. Religious sacrifices in those days, in those days they, whether Jewish or pagan, they were always done to gain something from God. Well, Paul spent 11 chapters telling you you've already got that as a gift in Christ. It's impossible to be more forgiven or more blessed than you already are in him. And Paul just spent the last 11 chapters talking about how you cannot be any more forgiven or have any more favor because of Christ. Transformed, um, it, it's the Greek word metamorpho. And, it, and, and, and it's where we get the word, obviously, metamorphosis. And the second commandment he gives is to be transformed. And that Greek word is where we get our English word metamorphosis. It's, it means to be changed from within. It's the word we now use to describe what happens to a, a caterpillar when they sew themselves up in a cocoon. It's the process that a caterpillar goes through to turn into a, a butterfly and it's just like Christ. 